from Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. Guy Raz. And on the show today, actor, musician, entrepreneur, crafter. Oh, I have a podcast too. (laughs) I forgot about that. The multi-talented Zoe Deschanel. Sometimes like your music brain just shuts off. It's just like, I just want to listen to silence and read a book or write something. You know, you can come to that other pursuit with a new perspective. Zoe Deschanel is one of the best-known actors of her generation. She's had major roles in the films Almost Famous, Elf, and, of course, 500 Days of Summer. But she's also had major success on network television as the star of New Girl. And that's hard. Very few actors can do both film and TV well. But what sets her apart from so many of her fellow actors is that Zoe is also a successful singer and musician. You might know her band, She and Him. She's a podcaster. The podcast is called Welcome to Our Show. She's a maker of crafts, a master on the cricket machine, and an entrepreneur. And by doing so many different things, it's actually made her better at the others. So in this episode of The Great Creators, you'll find out how Zoe Deschanel learned to conquer stage fright and get over self-doubt, how she figured out her approach to the craft of songwriting, and why at a low point in her life, when no one was calling, she actually thought her acting career was over. That's all coming up after this quick break. Zoe Deschanel spent most of her early life in Southern California. Her mom, Mary Jo, is an actor, and her dad, Caleb, is a cinematographer, famous for his work on films like The Right Stuff, The Natural, and The Patriot. Caleb was part of a young generation of filmmakers, many of whom met in their early 20s. People like George Lucas, John Milius, and other major players who kind of shaped Hollywood in the 70s and 80s. So although it didn't seem unusual at the time, Zoe was surrounded by some of the most creative people in the world, literally, as far back as she can remember. My baby blanket, like the one that I took everywhere as a kid, that was like worn down, that if you left at a restaurant, you'd cry. Yeah. George Lucas <laughs> gave me that blanket wow. when I was born. So I knew like George Lucas gave me my baby blanket and I knew he did Star Wars and was a friend of my parents, but it was kind of hard to, you know, I understood everything through a, a kid lens, but those were all just like friends of my parents. I mean, yeah. they were all like really normal people to me. Not, they didn't seem like celebrities, I guess. Did you grow up going to film sets, like going to the yes. right, I mean, you were a little kid, but you know, beyond the right stuff and the natural. I when yeah. they did the right stuff. I don't really remember that, but I remember going to the set. I don't think I knew like who any movie stars were or anything. So I rem- what I remember were donuts <laughs> Yeah, right. at the craft service table. Right. And my sister and I were like, this is the life. Right. <laughs> there are donuts here all the time. <laughs> and my mom's like, yeah, but if you're an actor, you can't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother w- was an actor. Still, still it, an they actor. both are still. I mean, my still mom's a writer, actor. Yeah, sh- I mean, they're both still. And your mom, I mean, your mom was in some of those movies. I mean, did you, Yeah. did your dad travel a lot, by the way, when you were a kid? So yeah, my dad traveled a ton and we would go with him a lot. And we actually lived all over the world until I was about eight years old. And Hmm. my sister was in middle school, I guess. But yeah, we lived in the Seychelles Islands. We lived in Yugoslavia, in London. All for films. We lived all for films. Yeah. Yeah. We were in... Atlanta, Buffalo, wow. New York. Like, I remember all these places, but like from, again, from a kid's per- perspective. Were you the kind of kid from an early age that would stand up in front of your parents' friends and sing or perform? Definitely, I was a performer. Mm-hmm. Not always like if if my parents wanted me to do something, like, well, do, play that piano piece you learned. I'd be like, no. 
but I'll do this puppet show. You know, I would, <laughs> it would be like kind of on my terms. There's this story my parents always told of me when I was two or three years old at preschool doing the Three Little Pigs. And I was the third pig and there were there was a narrator and I kept interrupting the narrator <laughs> and saying, I'm the third baby pig, the third baby pig. <laughs> and that um, the other kid wasn't knocking right on my door and I didn't wake up until they knocked right. I was kind of like uh, a diva about my performance. And, and what about instruments? Did you play instruments from an early age? Yeah, well, my parents had this funny thing where they didn't, like, they said I couldn't take piano lessons till I was eight or something. And I was, I kept begging them. I just want, all I wanted was to take piano. And they're like, not until you're eight, because I think they thought I would would be more serious about it if I were a little bit older. But then I, we, we were living in the Seychelles. And your your dad was, was like working on a film there? He was directing a movie called Crusoe about Robbins and Crusoe. So they had to find a place that was very remote. Yeah. And they had brought a little keyboard called a Casio SK-1, which is kind of now like a a, a hot item. Like people yeah. like, love this little keyboard. It was like a 1980s keyboard. Very small. Um, we brought that with us. And that was just endless entertainment for me. I loved playing it. And you could record your own like little samples in it and then, you know, play songs um it wouldn't play like two notes at the same time but hey (laughs) um i always had like massive interest in music um, and sang from a young age but i didn't have formal training till i was about eight so i guess around eight or nine you the the family kind of settles in los angeles for more kind of sort of a stable life yes and and you grew up in you grew up in in la yeah. How would you describe yourself as a as sort of a teenager? Were you were you kind of like the drama kid acting in, in the plays and, you know, sort of getting up on stage? Was that your passion? Yes. I mean, definitely people knew me singing and uh, acting in the school plays. I was very into like vintage fashion, too. And I would dress up like every day. <laughs> I would make my own clothes a lot of times and also go part of it was like I went to school with a lot of like very wealthy kids who could just kind of buy whatever. But my mom had me on like this budget and she's like, you can here's your budget. You can spend it on clothes if you want or you could spend it on movies. I'm like or music. And I was like, I want all those things. So (laughs) making clothes and going shopping at, you know, Salvation Army, those were ways I could like spend a little money on clothes and then have some left over for other hmm. stuff. And and so when you were and, and I when you were in, in high school cuz I, I know you went to to Crossroads school and I think it's in Santa Monica, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, and from from what I understand, I mean there were and still are there kids of actors there and and, and the, the kids that, that you went to high school with who are now well-known actors. So was it the kind of school where a lot of the kids that you were around wanted to become actors? Oh yeah. There were so many talented like actors, but there were also amazing artists, photographers, uh, musicians. Our orchestra was incredible, like world renowned. There were people from all over the world and the country who came to be in our or- orchestra or our jazz band. It was a really um, special school to go to. How how would you describe yourself in high school? Were you popular? Were you kind of? I mean, how do you think you were perceived? <laughs> I wasn't popular. I wasn't like I was I was kind of shy and I kept kept to myself a lot. If you knew me, I wasn't quiet, but like to the people who didn't know me, I I kind of kept to myself. What do you think it was about about being on stage that that appealed to you that you I mean, it's interesting because if you if you look at a lot of athletes, right? Um Many of them have a one or two parents who were Division One athletes or professional athletes, right. and many actors have parents like your mom was an actor, right? Yeah, your, and and your dad wasn't an actor, but was a filmmaker. So it it seems like okay that that that's a perfectly natural fit. But what was it about being on stage that you that just spoke to you? Whenever I was on stage, I felt so much more comfortable than I was in life. <laughs> And I remember, you know, I mean, it kind of dawned on me like over 
the years that I was sort of unintentionally funny <laughs> um, on stage. Like for some reason, I would do stuff where I wasn't intentionally trying to make people laugh, but they would laugh. And it was really satisfying when hmm. people would laugh. Um, so I think when I was really young, I was kind of a, I was like always comic relief. And then as, as I got a little bit older, I started getting more lead roles and they're not always the comedic roles. But yeah, I mean, I definitely was drawn to comedic roles. And I've always like thought of myself as a, a comedic actor. Like, yeah, I, I can do drama and I enjoy drama, but it's like 20% of the time drama. But like the rest, I really just like laughing. I, I saw a video of your first ever television role. It was in a, a oh. <laughs> TV show called Veronica's Closet, where it's a, yes. it's a, it's a comedic role. It's a, a part in that show. But I wonder, when did you, when did you start to feel like you had potential to do this, that you were actually maybe good at it? Was it something somebody said to you? Um, because no one's good at anything when they start, right? Like if you oh, went yeah. and saw, like even if you see yourself in this role in Veronica's Closet, you might be, you know, mortified or or, or maybe not or maybe proud of it. But it's oh, yeah. it's an early role. I look at like a lot of even the stuff that people still talk to me about and I'm like, oh, I wouldn't make that choice now, you know. Same with my records. too. So I listen to my first and, record yeah. and I'm like, well, I would make a different choice there now. But, you know, those things are what they are and they're little time capsules and they're special in their own way. Um Again, going to Crossroads, there were a lot of people who had, you know, well-known or very well-respected parents. And I just remember doing this um, play and all these people coming up to me and, you know, who were well-known people who were saying that I was good. <laughs> and that was like, I couldn't believe it. I remember yeah. being like, oh, my God, like, this could be a thing. Do you remember what play it was? So they do like a fundraiser that um, every couple years at Crossroads, and it was like a kind of rewritten version of Wizard of Oz. Right. Very you were Dorothy. Special. I was. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember? I don't want to brag, but <laughs> <laughs> listen, Dorothy's th that's the role. Um, so you so you you do that role, and there are people in the audience, some of whom because it's Los Angeles, are connected yeah. to the industry. Maybe some of them are even yeah. famous, are coming up to you and saying, yeah. you were great. Do you, do you happen to remember any particular person who said that to you? Well, John Ritter was like, wow. his son was in my class, and he was always like so incredible. Like, I'll probably cry talking about him because I'm, it was so, like, he was such a great guy. Mm. Um, but he was always so supportive. <laughs> he was always so supportive of me because mm. I knew him since I was five. Yeah. So I remember him and I remember um, Ted Danson and a lot of other amazing people. Uh, I have to go back through my diary, but I remember those two, you know, kind of coming up to me and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe yeah. these people are telling me I did a good job, you know? Yeah. So when you were already 17, 18, you'd already done this this role on, on that TV show, that small part. And then... You had you actually got a role in a in a film, an indie film, I think, around that time. Was it was it pretty clear to you that this was what you were going to pursue? Uh, because you did go to college for some time. You spent, I think, almost a year at Northwestern in Chicago. Yeah, well, I I got my first role my senior year of high school, and it was a Lawrence Kasdan movie, and um, he actually saw me in a school play too. Mm -hmm. um, he was looking for like a you know, teenager. But yeah, I did my first movie. I went off to college. And when I got to college, I said, you know, studying theater, I didn't want anybody to treat me it, like I didn't want opportunities because people knew that I had done a movie or something. So I didn't tell anybody that I'd done a movie like the whole time I was there. I was like, I don't want anyone to know because the movie hadn't come out yet. Right. And then on my winter break from my freshman year at Northwestern, I auditioned for Almost Famous. I was 18 and I didn't hear anything for a few months except, you know, maybe good job or something, but right. didn't hear anything. And then I was home for spring break and I got this call that Cameron Crowe wanted to meet me um, for a part. And... Like when I first read, I read like these kind of generic sides. They weren't from the movie. They were just kind of a hinting at the movie. And it was more like the kind of groupy characters. Right. 
And when I went in for Cameron, I got I got like these more specific sides that the sister of a sister role. And um, nobody was really allowed to read a script or anything. So I wasn't really sure what I was auditioning for, but I went in and had like a two hour work session with him. And he was just wonderful. Yeah. Turned out that the movie had been all cast and Kate Hudson, who ended up playing one of the lead characters, Penny Lane, had been cast in my role. And I think Sarah Polly had been cast in her role. And then when Sarah Polly fell out, Kate took that role. And then they were looking for somebody to play the sister. But funnily enough, I went to high school with Kate Hudson. Right. She was a year ahead of me. So mm-hmm. we did many plays together. So you got you got that role as Anita Miller, which is yes. again not a comedic role. It's I mean no. she I think based on Cameron Crowe I mean, the, the film is based on Cameron Crowe's life story and and in the film she gives her record collection to to William to the kid um, who then you know that exposes him to rock and roll and she's sort of a, a rebel and Frances McDormand is the mom. Yeah. When you were on the set, I mean, I, and and it's probably maybe hard to remember, but when you were. On the set with like Frances McDormand, you know, oh. <laughs> who's major right actor and just an incredibly accomplished actor, and um, were you nervous? Do you get nervous? I mean, it, you know, being in a scene with that person, like, is there? Do, do you remember feeling pressure, like I've got to nail this because I don't want to hold this production up or whatever it might be? Yeah, I mean, I always say this to people because. People will come up to me and say, like, how do you do it? Like, I would be so nervous going on stage or being on a set. And I'm like, so physiologically, like, fear and and excitement are, like, the same, you know, yeah. like, fear, yeah. like, or stage fright, I guess. Stage fright and excitement are, like, the same response. It's just right. how you interpret it. So I always just interpreted it as excitement. I'm like, okay, you know, even when I've played huge shows, which, like, feel like, a lot of pressure. I would interpret that as like, ooh, this is exciting. This is fun, you know? And yeah, sometimes there's a little bit of fear, but I would say it felt fun, not 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 scary. Walk me through the process. I know not just with this role with Anita Anita, but also with, you know, you would go on to to be an elf and and uh, that was a huge role and then subsequently, you know, we know so many roles you played, but walk me through the process of becoming that character. First of all, when you are performing as a character, how much of yourself do you bring into that? Because I see actors on stage or or in a film, and I think there has to be a part of them in that character. But but again, like that could be entirely wrong. Like like you you see Marlon Brando perform as you know in the characters that he was, and then you see him talk about them, and 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 then you it becomes clear that there really was nothing about him who he was in those characters or maybe just a part of it. How do you, how do you think about who you are and the characters you play? I mean, I think there has to be like a seed of something. It doesn't have to be like a lot. I've certainly had more in common with some characters than others, you know? But for me, it's about empathy. I myself don't have to be just like a character at all. And I, I'm I'm most of the time not but I have to be able to empathize and see their choices and why they make those choices and then I think there's like I think one thing a lot of people don't talk about because it feels less romantic but there's a ton of technical stuff in acting that you Mm -hmm. just kind of have to you know and that you just kind of like have to be friends with you know because there's changing how you appear to the outside world is is technical you know your your voice your walk how you appear like what you wear i get really into all of those things like i love working with costume designers and makeup artists and hairdressers because that is a hugely important collaboration for an actor so i love getting into the character that way, once you dress like a character and you look like a character, you feel like a character, yeah. and then you sort of understand a lot of those choices. How much concentration does it require, though, to become that character? Like, if you're distracted, right, if there's something happening in other parts of your, your life, can you switch on and become that yes. character? Well, you should be able to. I think it's kind of, I mean, look, it's my job to go on set, shake off whatever's happening, 
be there, be present, know my lines, have a take, you know, a lot of acting. And I'm not necessarily talking about the script, but a lot of it is improvisational. Like Mm -hmm. they talk about like the magic that happens on the day. That is so much of a, you know, so much a part of what is exciting about watching a movie is like the stuff that you didn't plan for that happened because you had like two actors that had chemistry or something funny happened or something interesting happened or the sunset was amazing. You know, all these things are the things that happen on the day and you have to be there and present and ready for those things to really, to really make the most, I guess, of the filmmaking process. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, how an unexpected collaboration with a musical hero led Zoe to form a band and start pursuing a career in music. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. So it's 2005, and Zoe Deschanel's acting career is taking off. Almost Famous is followed by Elf, and then a steady stream of indie film roles. But by the end of the early 2000s, after spending so much time on the road for film shoots, Zoe starts to find inspiration, privately at first, in music. I found being on locations very, very lonely. I always have. And so, like, kind of my outlet would be writing songs about loneliness. (laughs) You know, it's like, uh, I'm lonely in this random apartment in wherever, you know, and I'm going to write a song about it. Or, you know, I'm going to take the seed of loneliness and make it a character or switch it around, write a song about not being lonely. You know, it's kind of like taking those ideas and flipping them. And so usually it it would be like a seed of emotion that was there. And I kind of take that and make that the inspiration for songs. Yeah. I mean, to tell me about that process. Were you just uh, like doing it in private or, or like just finding time to write lyrics when you had downtime? It was always something I would do when I was like alone for a while. It's very solitary for me. A lot of times I'd just bring a guitar or a uke or a keyboard on location with me if I were, you know, making a movie. But Yeah, I'm not like a, you know, there are songwriters that like write every day and I am not one of those. I wish I were. And what's funny, you know, I'm not, I was always writing lyrics, but it's because I don't really, I love writing music more than I love (laughs) writing lyrics. I love writing melodies, like chord progressions. I love that part. Writing lyrics is really hard for me. (laughs) And it's why I was always writing them. I would be on a plane and I would sit with a notepad and I would, lyrics are about, distilling an emotion to like the you know you keep distilling and distilling you try to make it as short as possible like how can you say the most with the least words so I would just sit with a notepad and like write platitudes and tropes and try to figure out and then I'm like how do you turn it on its head like what happens if I reverse that what's the opposite of that Mm -hmm. I just remember every time I was on a plane I would sit with a little notebook and I'd just write these and those little kind of those end up being like the thesis of your song you know And when you're writing lyrics or, or, or like trying to come up with melodies, because I mean, you can't write a perfect song right away, right? Although there are, there are songs, amazing songs that were written in like 12 minutes, but it, it's very rare, right? Does it does it take time for you to write a great song? So it's funny that you're talking about the the like 12 minute thing. I have one song I wrote really fast and it's probably my favorite song I've ever written called Thieves. It was the first song on my second record, volume two. And it just came out like the lyrics and the music and the chord progression, everything came out at once. And it was like, as if I was like channeling and I'm like, I normally have to like write a chorus. I'll keep it around for a couple right. months. Like, and then I might be like, Oh, maybe I can figure out a verse today. You know, it's like, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a connection between the practice of, writing music and also becoming better at as an actor? I mean, I think that any creative things help each other. So whatever it is I'm doing that's creative, like 
when we're recording in the studio, like we always say like, oh, I need an ear break after like, you know, five hours. You're like, oh, I need an ear break. Sometimes like your music brain just shuts off. And it's like sometimes that ear break is just like, I just want to listen to silence and read a book or, you know, write something or like. So I think these larger breaks, too, where you're maybe not doing things, you can kind of come to that, you know, other pursuit with a new perspective. And I think anything creative feeds into anything else creative personally hmm. the more experience you have you're drawing you know you're always especially for, as an actor you, uh, mainly you are drawing for on things and if you're just doing acting roles you stop being a person in a weird right. way like i remember right. doing so many acting roles in a row that i was like i have nothing left i have like no ideas <laughs> i just feel spent i haven't met any real people who aren't in the film business like in you know 10 months and I'm just I need a break like hmm. so I think doing music you know and certainly it's it's allowed me to do a lot of roles where I have you know they're like musical components and I am a touring musician you know I put out well we're, we're putting out our seventh record wow. pretty soon and so I have all that experience to draw from that I'm like, I can go into a, you know, a situation on a movie set where we're like, you know, in a fake band and I can be like, well, I'm in a real band. So, yeah. <laughs> and I have a lot of touring experience and recording experience. So that's always nice to have real life experience to draw from. Um, but I definitely think that the, you know, different creative pursuits really help you get better at you know, other ones. Yeah, it's interesting because you could look at the the profession of acting as the creative outlet, right? Like you you you're yeah. given a role and then you make that role your own. And and yeah. that's what a screenwriter or a director wants you to do. But but for you and and I totally understand this, like you your outlet, what what became an outlet for you was was music. Was writing yes. music. Yeah. Well, it's a very like different part of a creative process than acting. Acting, you're kind of like somewhere in the middle, right? There's like, you know, writing and prepping the movie and then the actors make it come to life and then the editor really finishes it and polishes it up. And it's extremely collaborative and you are only so good as the other people you're working with. Um, whereas I love the process of making music because I write songs send them to matt and, and just to clarify you're talking about uh, matt ward people may know him as m ward yes uh, he's the other half of your band she and him sorry go ahead yep he comes up with a production plan we go in the studio it's usually just the two of us and then we'll bring in other musicians to play as needed and we'll have a you know an engineer we work with but it's really very very intimate as far as like collaborative creative experience yeah uh goes and we can make all those pretty much like all those bigger decisions we're making all of them so on a film set it's such a small part even though it's a very public part it's a small part in a very big machine whereas the music machine is very small and so i need both to be happy I mean, you managed to do something very rare, which is to have a successful acting career and music career, which is really hard to do. I remember I first heard M. Ward. I first heard his cover of Let's Dance by David Bowie in like so 2005. Good, right? And I was like uh, four, I think, which was four or five. And it was uh, late at night I was driving and it was just blew my mind. It was the most incredible, beautiful thing I'd, I'd heard. I think you met him in 2006 and you, or she, she started to collaborate with him in 2006 and you would then go on to release an album together and pr create a performance duo, she and him. Were you – was a part of – any part of you nervous or worried about how that would be perceived like, oh, here's this actor trying to be a singer? Yes, 100%. And it's all in the design of how we did that, how we released our first record how we formed our band so you thought um, that through yes yeah. so i met matt i had tons of songs matt i was a fan just like you i'd heard him on i heard this song vincent o'brien was the first mm -hmm. m word song i heard and i was like blown away it just spoke to me so much and i got offered this movie maybe a year after that 
called The Mm Go-Getter. And it was a really nice script and everything. I want to do the movie, but they said, M. Ward's doing music. And I was like, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) It was like, I had to do that movie because Matt was doing the music. And then the director said, you know, I really like your voice. I'd love you to do a duet with him. And, you know, we met doing this duet. I had a friend who kind of suggested I, you know, share my music with Matt, which was, I was very nervous. So I had no idea if he'd think it was, you know, good or bad or whatever. And um, I sent him maybe six of my songs. They had these like very kind of basic home demos of me playing like all the instruments. (laughs) And I sent him the songs and he said, you know, maybe a week later, like, let's, let's make a record. Wow. And so I knew like, okay, I, I had the avenue because I had, I had tried to make records with other people before, um, or I, I'd maybe like done a song or two with people and it just was never right. And I kind of was like abort mission, you know, after one or two sessions. And it wasn't until I met Matt and saw how he worked, which was like the way I knew I wanted to work, which was, it was very organic, very much like going to the heart of the music, not overly processing it. Yeah. Creating things that support the music, whether it's a bigger production or a smaller production, it's finding like the most organic way to make the music. And I just loved the way he approached producing. And so initially this, the the first record, volume one, first him record was supposed to be my record. And I started to get really nervous toward the end of the process because I was like, no one's, uh, I, you know, there are other people who have tried to, you know, go from acting to singing or acting to playing music and it hasn't gone very well. And it appears to be a vanity project. And I'm like, well, what's the antidote to a vanity project? Well, if it's anonymous. Mm -hmm. So Matt said to me, he said, look, I love playing music with you. I would love to be in a band with you if you want to be in a band with me. And I was like, obviously so (laughs) flattered and excited that, you know, M. Ward wanted to be in a band with me. Mm. And so we set about trying to find like the most generic name of a band <laughs> that's a girl and a boy and without so, using your names without using our names and so our first we sent you know you send out a, a like a sampler for press release right and we decided to send out the first record sampler with no information on About who, who we were so all of the first reviews and reactions were like totally genuine reactions to the music rather than me or Matt, you know, right. or, oh, this is, you know, a vanity project. They couldn't call it a vanity project because they didn't know who they I was. They didn't so, know who you were. Wow. So later, of course, you know, eventually people find out. <laughs> and like when we released the record, you know, people knew who we were, but since that it, it's it's kind of about how the initial reaction starts and then the reactions from that and i felt very happy that we kind of designed it that way cuz i guess i thought about it in this way i thought if nobody ever found out it was me mm. would i be okay with that and i thought long and hard about that and came to the conclusion that I would be okay with that because I love making music. And if people found this music and and loved it, not knowing me from Adam, I would be totally fine with that. Coming up after the break, how Zoe turned what's technically a disorder into a strength and why she almost walked away from acting right before a big breakthrough. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. So a career in film, TV, and music alone is rare. But for Zoe Deschanel, part of what she says keeps her creative energy flowing is doing even more, things that are outside her comfort zone. 
like business. About a decade ago, she co-founded an online publication called Hello Giggles that sold for a reported $30 million. And then she started another company called Lettuce Grow, which sells grow-your-own food kits. And her explanation for moving from project to project? I have ADHD. I was diagnosed with ADHD as a child. Oh, were you really? Yes. Yep. Yeah. I was wow. like early. Like it wasn't that common that girls were diagnosed with no. ADHD. Yeah. And I was as probably when I was nine. Um, it manifested differently in me than you know other people. I think a lot of times boys are really hyperactive. Right. I was not hyperactive. I had a problem with over-focusing, huh. where I focused so much on one thing, I like could not hear, see, anything else. Wow. So I have like a good ability to hyper-focus, and then once I'm done with that, move on move to the on. next thing. So it's, but as a child, that was very challenging for me. And I, I always say like, these things that are challenging as as a child, and that like teachers have a hard time dealing with, often are superpowers as a grown-up. Because yeah. I, as early as high school, I remember I could study for a test in like, I could cram like all the information from the whole year in my head in like two hours if I was in the right hyper-focused mindset. Yeah. No, it's interesting because a lot of the entrepreneurs I've, I've interviewed on How I Built This were diagnosed yeah. with ADHD as kids. And it's, it's, it's not uncommon because you, you know, and, and the way it sounds like you kind of deal with it and make it work for you is to to do multiple projects, but kind of move from one to the other. You know, sometimes you might be working on this thing on on a, on a role. Sometimes you might be yeah. focused on making music. Sometimes you might be performing. Sometimes you might go like make a dress. Yes, exactly. I I think it's really helpful in a creative profession. So many actors. I know, are ADHD. I would say more ADHD actors than not ADHD. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where where do ideas come, where do you get ideas from, whether it's making an indoor edible plant business or, or embodying a role or picking up a ukulele and writing a song? Do you, do you know where you, where you get them from, where you find ideas? Well, Certainly you can like go looking for ideas yeah. and certainly you can be inspired by the things around you and kind of take those things and make them into new things. It's like upcycling inspiration, mm. but really talk about real magic. I know it sounds corny. I truly don't know where a lot of it comes from. When, especially songs, I'm always blown away by the feeling that something supernatural happened. If I go and I'm able to write a song in like one sitting, that you walked in a room, there was no song, and you walked out of the room and you had a song. Yeah. That's, that feels to me very magical. Like that is weird and awesome to me. But, but don't you think that you could also look at that and say, yeah, that's magical. But it's the result of years yeah. and years of grinding away at the craft, right? It's like oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like you can, it's you both. can watch an NBA player sink a three pointer, and it's a magical moment. But that player has been been shooting from that that point for twenty years of of his yes. or her life. You know, it's hard because you call it hard work, but it also just feels like excitement and obsession, yeah. you know, like obsession with something you love. I mean, with like music, I would be, I remember being a kid and I'd be like obsessed with a chord progression. I'd be like, oh, or the way a melody intersected with a chord progression or, you know, I'm a, like, I love harmonies and I love mm -hmm. singing harmonies. It's like just obsessed with those things, you know, and the way that they all come together to make a certain sound and going, oh, I just love yeah. that, so the way that sounds, you know? And I guess you could call it hard work because it's like lots of hours go into it and doing it, but if you love it, it doesn't feel like that, you know? It's kind of like the same thing we were talking about with the excitement versus stage fright. Yeah. Did you listen to, did you, when you were a kid, did you grow up hearing like pet, pet sounds? Oh, yeah. Because you talk about harmony. Obsessed. I just think of that. Like, yeah. 
totally obsessed with Brian Wilson since I was a little kid. And just an, I mean, incredible is an understatement. I mean, that record is is so incredible. I can talk about that. For, I we could talk about that. And in fact, our new record is a uh, Brian Wilson songbook. Oh wow! So yeah, that was our pandemic project. Wow. And I get. I mean, I'm singing like. 30, 40 tracks of harmonies like on every song, which was just such a fun, I mean, it's like <laughs> such a fun challenge. And and those Beach Boys harmonies are just so incredible. I can't even break them down a lot of times personally. Like it's hard for me to break them down. So I had to kind of go, what's my version of this, mm. you know? Okay, I want to I wanna talk about New Girl. Um, and for anyone who, who doesn't, uh, no, this was the, no about it. it was a sitcom on Fox, and and you played the the title character. And when you um when you when you took on the role as Jess yes. in New Girl, uh, that was that was a comedic role that you actually, from everything I've read, really developed. Like yeah. you, like that was a character that you were kind of not just given a free reign to develop. It it like to really make that a character that wasn't quite written in that uh, in that way. Yeah, I I mean, Liz Merriweather was just such a great creative collaborator. She's the, you know, writer, creator of New Girl. And I would say like that part is really a, you know, a collaboration between me and, and Liz. And I loved getting to just bring ideas to the table. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about doing a TV show. You know, it's 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 a like a living thing. You know, you can watch the episode mm -hmm. one week and then the next week you're playing that character again and you can kind of lean into things or, you know, modify things as you see, you know, fit. It's just a really I loved getting to do. I loved get I I didn't think I would before. You know, I didn't know I never pursued doing television really until yeah. that show. I was kind of didn't want to be tied down to one character, but finding that character was such a, it was, I loved how she was written and um, I loved, you know, the seed of the character in there when I read the, the pilot and I just, it gave me so many ideas, mm. you know? I always know good writing when, you read it, you want to say it, you can't wait to say it. And then right. I couldn't wait to bring other ideas to the table and I couldn't wait to to play with it. And the other thing is I had never played a character like that before. And when I read it, I said, I know I can do this. I like that. This is that I know I have to play this part. I didn't think anyone else was going to bring the same perspective I I would to that character. And it just made me like feel gleeful and excited and like I couldn't wait to do it, you know? I, I wonder when you're on stage, you're communicating to a live audience, right? Yes. And when you are on your podcast, you're communicating through microphone, which is how mm -hmm. I communicate with people mm -hmm. most of the time. When you are acting in a film, are you communicating to an audience in a cinema and when you act for television, are you communicating to an audience on their sofas at home or 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 not? Is it is it more or less I the am always thinking like being the daughter of a cinematographer, I am always thinking about frame. I'm also thinking about how close, you know, is this shot? It's why I don't love like sometimes you're on a show or a movie and they'll have three cameras. And right. I'm like, I can't adjust my performance. I'm going to do a different performance if they are, you know, in a extreme close up versus like a wide shot. It's different because in the wide shot you see my whole body and you, and you know and and a lot of comedy is knowing your frame because say physical comedy you're going like you might have to fall out of frame and if you don't know where the frame is then it's not, you know, funny because you don't do it right. So right. a lot of it is understanding that stuff. And that's one thing, you know, it's really important for a young actor going, you know, going into this to know, to really be aware of all the other jobs on set and be aware of how you are collaborating with them all the time, even if you don't know it, you know, but on stage, you have the audience. So the audience like becomes like a participant in a way because they're, they're clapping, there, singing, yeah. they're clapping, they're, you know, they're laughing, they're really participating. But when you don't have a live audience, you need a character, you might call it the straight man character. Right. And on New Girl, it changed every episode who was playing straight man or even every scene to scene. But a lot of times you think of it as like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis or something like that. Right. Like, 
you have the person who's the straight man who's kind of giving like a look like, are you hearing this? Like, um, you know, that person is like, I think of the satellite for the audience. Like you need to have both. You can't have in a movie or a TV show, you can't have just like crazy characters. You always need the person that the audience is relating to. You know, uh, with New Girl, I mean, that show is so successful, right? I mean, I think I think it had like seven seasons. Yeah, seven but, seasons. but I wonder, have you ever struggled with doubts about your abilities? Like, have you ever yeah, had any course. sort of like <laughs> debilitating moments where you thought, you know, I suck? I, oh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, one of those things, one of the things about doing a, a weekly TV show on network television, you're doing so many episodes, some of them are going to be not as good as others and that you realize that you have to do the best you can on a day you have to stop getting in your head about like oh my god i'm not good today like i lost it or you know you you have to let go of those because you have to realize that a lot of times it's not going to be perfect yeah we have to make so many of these episodes and then you just like hope the overall it's going to be good that's probably the most distracting thing for an actor that really interferes with performance is getting caught up in, am I good? Am I bad? Oh my God, I'm not good. I'm not bad. You know, you have to hopefully trust that, you know, your director knows what they're doing or, you know, that there's somebody on set that's going to give you feedback. You always need to have that person, whether it's a director, producer, or writer, somebody that is watching that's giving you feedback and ideas. That's And that's where the collaboration comes. Sometimes you need somebody to push you to go bigger. And you might think like, this is the corniest choice I could make. And it ends up being the right thing because, you know, they're seeing the other side, you know, or they might need to rein you in because you're pushing it too much. I think um, that's really important. It's really hard if you're on a set and you don't have anybody you totally trust on the other side of the camera and you're having to like direct yourself, which happens sometimes. Did you ever have a period in your career, do you remember a period in your career where you felt like you 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 were more filled with self-doubt? Oh my, yes. So I've had a long career. I started acting when I was 17. I've had so many like peaks and valleys. And sometimes you don't even know you're in a peak when you are. And then right. the valleys you really are aware of. Like right. I, before I did New Girl, I almost quit. Wow. Really? You almost quit acting before that role came? Yeah. Because so like we have to look at historically where we were in like the movie making business. I was doing movies. I hadn't ever done a TV show or really entertained it. I did lots of indie movies that were like small, intimate indie movies. I did 500 Days of Summer. I'd done tons of like smaller movies that kind of felt like, you know, they were like more character driven pieces. Right. Right. And around 2009, 2010, there were a bunch of studios cut their budgets for smaller character driven movies and started investing only in like superhero movies yes, and which they still big, do. huge, you know, movies. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know where I fit in here. And well. I just wasn't sure, you know, and that was a big valley for me. Well, in terms of acting, I was just thankful that I had music because I was like 2010, I was touring 10 months out of the year. Like yeah. I was playing so many shows and I was enjoying it. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll just do, you know, music and be happy doing music and that's okay. And then New Girl came along and I just had such a like gleeful childlike reaction to that script. And, you know, that was one valley. I've had like another one, like after having kids, it was like, you know, when you have kids, yeah. the one thing no one tells you is how like much of a existential crisis you'll have <laughs> <laughs> creating humans and having to, you know, taking care of them and how wonderful it is, but how it resets your priorities and how yeah. how you think about things in a totally different way. And when I, after I, New Girl ended and I had my son, I was, I mean, I had a, a newborn and a two-year-old at home the last season of New Girl. And I was just- It's a lot. Like, I was- shell-shocked and I needed a break 
but whenever you take a break, so I took a break and then there's like pandemic, you know, and like, and whenever you take a break, it's really scary because you like people in the world are always, you know, it's like pe- lots of people watching new girl, watching all the stuff that I did, but in the industry, people are like, well, why haven't you worked in two years? Or, and you're or like, what's well, next? I have a baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I have a baby. I need to take care of the baby. <laughs> and then I, you know, so I, I think, you know, now like I, this year I've worked a lot and it's all of a sudden everything's back to, you know, being full speed yeah. ahead. But, you know, those, I think it's really important to have those kind of breaks where you like reset and think about how, you know, you see your career and what really does make you happy. Cause then you can just understand like what really makes you tick and what you can throw yourself in to do the best job, you know? Yeah. Cause if you're phoning it in, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> right. I wonder there's a, there's like a description about you, a popular sort of media description about you that you are aware of like the quirky Zoe Deschanel yes. character. And you mm-hmm. actually, parodied that character on Saturday Night Live, um, <laughs> which was so fun. And I don't, if people haven't seen that clip, you should check it out. You play Mary Kate Olsen in that, yes. in that skit. Who I love. Was, I love Mary Kate Olsen. And Abby Elliott is doing a parody of you, like a over the top parody of you. <laughs> what do you, what do you make of that, of that kind of, you know, here's Zoe Deschanel. She plays ukulele. She makes crafts. She knits. She <laughs> sings songs, you know, obviously you had fun with that, but do you think it's, do you think there's some truth to it or do you think it's nonsense or do you think it's does annoy you? No, it you know, I think maybe like when I was younger, there was I felt a little embarrassed maybe by it or just like by, you know, the things people would say about me. But then I realized like the things that people say about you, that that's who you are to them. And that ends up being what makes you unique. And special and stand out. And so I have to, it was never something I was leaning into. Those were all things that I genuinely enjoyed. I have a wall of ukuleles like over here. <laughs> I, You can't see them, but they're like there, ukuleles. Oh, wow. I've got a wall of guitars yeah. too. But, you know, I like crafting and I like, you know, a lot of those things. <laughs> That's just me, you know? And I thought it was funny. And the sooner you can make fun of yourself, the better you'll feel. (laughs) (laughs) How do you get better at what you do? Do you, like whether it's acting or singing or performing, do you, do you analyze what you do? Do you, do you watch your work? Do you listen to your work? Oh, well, with music, we have to, I mean, we're listening constantly. It's like listening, listening, listening. I mean, listening to mixes and remixes and masters and you know all those things it's just listening to your own self and that's very much part of music for acting watching others you know watching other people act especially when I'm working with them um, and trying to to see why doing what they do makes them good or watchable or compelling analyzing you know, performances within the context of that film and that filmmaker. Because again, it's such a collaborative art. You know, if you're doing a performance and you're acting like you're in the Mary Tyler Moore show, but you're Mm -hmm. in The Godfather, it's not going to work. So knowing who you're working with and how, you know, it's going to fit into that puzzle piece is really important. So finally, when you think about the creative process. Do you think that for you, it's it's a matter of just constantly propelling forward and just kind of yes. trying things as, to, that appeal to you? Or do you think it's deliberate, you know, thinking through what you want to do? Or do you think it's more spontaneous for you? It's kind of like, I, I mean, I don't want to compare it to sports exactly, but you know, it's like you say, like you prepare and prepare and prepare. And then on the day, you know, it's like what happens in the moment. It's kind of like a mix of the two because there is a lot of careful, measured preparation that goes into, you know, say preparing for a role or, you know, getting better at playing music. I sit and play, you know, cover songs all the time because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But all that stuff kind of prepares me for what I'm doing. And so I would say like there's... 
there's that practice and that preparation that's very measured and careful and thoughtful. And then what roles I take or what projects I work on is also very measured and very careful. But I would say like the on the day stuff, that's fun, that's improvisational, that's magical. That's like everything that you did beforehand prepared you for that moment. And then you kind of, you put all the stuff in your brain and then you forget about it when you're in the moment. That's Zoe Deschanel. By the way, she and him's Beach Boys tribute album, the one Zoe mentioned, it's called Melt Away, a tribute to Brian Wilson, and it's available right now. We'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. You can find those at thegreatcreators.com slash Deschanel. And you can check out our whole catalog of episodes there at thegreatcreators.com. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show this week. And if you liked what you heard, we have one small request. Please tell someone about it. Share a link or a tweet or post a story and hashtag The Great Creators. You can find us on social media by searching The Great Creators. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and I'm on TikTok as Guy Raz. So please spread the word and thanks. This episode was produced by Kevin Leahy and edited by Andrea Bruce with help from Jeff Rogers. Thanks also to Elaine Coates, Jenna Gedman, Nat Hoops, Michael May, Michelle Triant, Marita Murphy, and Daniel Shukin. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to The Great Creators from Built It Productions. <laughs>